I had been encouraged, sort of against my will, really, by Hans Duter to travel. He found out I could add engineering ability, and he wanted me to fix the buses, and he was going on his world traveling Sankirtan party. So we drove overland with Sachin Andan and a whole group of devotees, mostly Germans. And um, my idea was that we'd meet in Brindavan, where he was taking sannyas, and that I would get Harinam initiation there. That was my master plan. We were late. Uh, obviously, it's a challenge to drive from Europe to India. And when we got there, Srila Prabhupada had left Brindavan. And, uh, and I met Lokana Swami for the first time there. He'd taken sannyas at the same time. And that we started planning to go to Mayapur. And again, my plan was, okay, missed Vrindavan, but get the chance. I'd never seen Srila Prabhupada. Uh, I'd had association with Mukunda Maharaj or Mukunda Brahmachari then, and he'd inspired me so enthusiastically. I just couldn't wait to see Srila Prabhupada. So we drove again the Grand Trunk Road from uh, Brindavan to Mayapur, and then as we got very close to, to Mayapur, we were in two big buses. One of them broke down, and I was the guy that fixed the bus, so I got out to fix the bus. All of the other devotees jumped in the other bus and drove off. And then I fixed the bus, and then I was in a situation where I realized that I don't know how to get to Mayapur. You know, the devotees that we picked up in Calcutta, who knew the way, I wasn't one of them. Anyway, so I just yelled out the window, please, you know, which way to Mayapur? And somehow, by Lord Chaitanya's mercy, I arrived in, in Mayapur, jumped out, I was totally dirty, greasy, fixing the bus. I took a shower, put tilak on, and I ran, and as I entered the temple room, Prabhupada just finished the initiation ceremony and stood up. But that first encounter, of encountering the pure devotee, Maha Bhagavat, was so profound that I knew at that time, I did, you know, I'd heard stories, I was enthusiastic, but I, you know, somehow or other, I hadn't had that direct contact. So with that direct contact, I knew, okay, this is, this is the person who's going to guide me. So then we went on Sankirtan, we went out doing chanting, distributing books and so forth. And after about six months, we came back to Brindavan. And I was still back to Steve, back to Bozo, and driving the bus. Lots of the devotees had fallen sick, they'd gotten all sorts of diseases. And so they concluded that, you know, I eventually ended up driving the bus. And when we got to Brindavan, Hansa Dutta approached me and said, why aren't you surrendering to Prabhupada? And I was like, what do you mean? He said, you know, you've been in the movement like more than a year now and you still haven't taken initiation. You know, what's the problem? And I was like, well, you know, you haven't really been in a situation. You know, I tried. <laughs> I've been trying, but we haven't succeeded. And he was like looking at me askance thinking, you know, there's something withholding. And anyway, later on that day, I got some devotee came to call me and said, Srila Prabhupada wants to see you. And I was initially thinking, as I don't know, some devotees did, have I made some you know, mistake or faux pas, or is probably going to chastise me, or what's going to happen? So I walked around to Srila Prabhupada's room, slightly in trepidation, and walked into his room, his quarters in Vrindavan. Prabhupada was sitting behind his desk. And as I walked in, Prabhupada looked up, and he said, your name is Ravi Das. And I was stunned. I simply stood there, mouth the gate, like. And Hansa Dutta was standing next to Srila Prabhupada. I think it was just Srila Prabhupada and Hansa Dutta. I can't remember anybody else being in the room. And Hansa Dutta said, I think you should pay obeisances, Prabhu. <laughs> and I suddenly came to my senses and, and, and paid obeisances. And as I sat up, Prabhupada was looking at me. And I wasn't quite sure what had happened exactly. You know, I'd, I'd been wanting this for such a long time and now suddenly it had happened, well, but in a way that I wasn't sort of expecting. So Prabhupada could see this sort of puzzled look on my face. And I said to Srila Prabhupada, is that it? 
And Prabhu looked at me like, and he said to me, what more do you want? And I, I was like, thrown back, what, what did I want? You know, Srila Prabhupada accepted me as his disciple and, and suddenly I'm asking him, is that enough? And so he said, so I, I, I had to sort of think about, and I said, but Prabhupada, I've seen other devotees, they have some, you know, some yagya. Prabhupada said, that is mere formality. He said, initiation takes place here in the heart. And I guess, yeah. I realised that in Mayapur, that experience had been there when I'd accepted Prabhupada, and that was so. That was the, my experience. And then later the same day, I got second. In, so another devotee came and said, "Prabhupada wants to see you." And I was like, "Oh, you know, he's decided against it. <laughs> he's realised I'm a rascal. You know, he's going to say I'm sorry. I made a mistake." So I went to see him, and then the devotees were waiting to get second initiation. And some of them were like, you know, BBT devotees, and they were like, they were like Brahmanas, you know, they were like chanting and thinking of shlokas, and they were saying, how many shlokas do you know? And I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I hadn't expected this. Anyway, then I, I went in and uh, Prabhupada recited the, the Gayatri Ordo, oh, yeah, right. So Prabhupada said, do you know how to count? And I said, well, yes. So Prabhupada said, like this, and he showed me how to count. But Prabhupada's thumb was very flexible. So when he got to the last number, he, his thumb didn't touch the last digit, you know. So then he said, so you do. So I counted, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And Prabhupada said, no, not like that, like this. And they did it again. And I couldn't understand. <laughs> I thought I was doing the same thing. So then I asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, is it off or on? He said, what do you mean, off or on? I said, is the thumb here? And he was like, yes. And I thought, okay, so I got that. So that was my Gayatri Diksha. I went, follow, as lots of devotees did, wherever Srila Prabhupada went, you wanted to go and be there. So Prabhupada went from Vrindavan to Delhi and I followed him to Delhi and had the opportunity to uh, go on a morning walk. And having a Western mind, I had read that there's a more powerful mantra than the Maha Mantra, the Panchatattva Mantra, because you can't commit offences. And I was meditating on this point that actually maybe I should chant more of the Panchatattva Maha Mantra and then I began to think with my Western mind, well, if Lord Chaitanya is very merciful and therefore doesn't accept this, who's more merciful than Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda? And I thought it's Srila Prabhupada. So I, I, the idea in my mind started to sort of come that actually what I should, really should be chanting on my Japa beads was not the Maha Mantra or the Panchatattva Mantra, but Srila Prabhupada. This was my great idea. So on the morning walk, I tested the theory initially by asking Prabhupada about um, spiritual master, you know, on the second offence. Because I was thinking, is it offensive? You know, because it says you shouldn't think of the names of, the, of demigods, but what about the name of the spiritual master? Does that fall in the same category? So we, Lokanath Swami was there and Prabhupada sort of encouraged Lokanath to answer. But I was slightly dissatisfied <laughs> that I didn't get the direct answer. So Another opportunity came up and I asked Srila Prabhupada, is the Panchatattva Mahamantra I've read that it's more powerful? So he said, yes. So I said, but more merciful than, than Lord Chaitanya Lord is, is you. So can I chant your name in Japa? And he said, have I asked you to do that? And uh, I said, no Srila Prabhupada. He said, it's right, the Panchatattva is more powerful, but Lord Chaitanya has asked us to chant the Maha Mantra, and therefore we chant the Maha Mantra. So it said that one should appear a fool before the spiritual master. With some of us, it's slightly easier than others. So that was my master plan quashed to make a rapid advancement by chanting Prabhupada's name. And during, and during that time, there was some Pandal program, and the devotees were. And the devotees started to chant Haribol, Haribol a lot 
you know, chanted the Maha Mantra, but then when they got in, it was sort of popular then that we chant different ways of Haribol. And uh, during the kirtan, which was led by a sannyasi, Prabhupada stopped, he said, stop the kirtan. And we all were armed. And then Prabhupada got Prajumna's son to lead the kirtan. And he said, just chant the Maha Mantra. And at that point I realized, you know, don't deviate. Prabhupada wanted us to follow. And that was, that was a very important lesson. It was, it's, you know, our Western minds are very prone to deviation. And uh, so I was out in Sankatan book distribution and I was driving the, the van and I came back to Delhi uh, a little bit earlier because uh, I had a van, I didn't have to take the bus or anything. And Prabhupada was uh, giving darshan. So I went up uh, and there was just a, an Indian family uh, in the darshan room and Prabhupada was talking in Hindi. And I sat to one side, uh, just to, you know, as we did, just to be with Srinath Prabhupada. And the, in the midst of the conversation, which Prabhupada was addressing to this Indian family, uh, he said in English, turn the fan on. So there was a, you know, mid-sentence, that English part came in. And I understood that part, I speak English. And I was thinking, well, was Prabhupada addressing that, you know, gentleman, he was there with his wife and family. And, and I be began to feel very uncomfortable that no one was turning the fan, well, I was the only one there. I began to feel more and more uncomfortable that this wasn't happening. I'd heard it, but I hadn't acted upon it. Anyway, then mid-sentence, Prabhupada turned and looked at me and said, why don't you turn the fan on? And it shocked me, like, you know, I'd leapt up and I ran to the back of the room. And um, in India, that there's like a million switches on the panel. And I just hit everything. I turned the lights on, the fans on, everything, and then spent ages trying to figure out which was the fan that Prabhupada went on. But the realization was that Prabhupada gives the same instructions to everyone. But sometimes, you know, it's, well, Bhakti Siddhanta did the same thing. He told everyone to preach, but Prabhupada heard the preaching. And I, and I heard and I didn't act upon it. And I really reflected on it later that actually when you hear an instruction from Prabhupada, he's not just shooting the breeze, he's giving you an instruction. So that was a, a vital lesson. Yeah, so we traveled around with our bus party doing programs and obviously occasionally we'd return to the temple and spend some time there repairing the bus. And so we came back to Vrindavan, after some time, at that time, the buses could only stay in India for a certain period of time. They couldn't stay there forever. They had to leave. And of course, so many of the devotees had dropped out that there were very few of the 20 or 30 devotees on the bus. I think there's probably just a real handful left. But more Indian boys had come on board. Atmatattva had joined in Chandigarh. Mm -hmm. So there were a few um, sort of Indian boys who'd come on. But I was having slight misgivings about the bus myself. Because whenever we'd go, they were, the people were very interested in the bus. Not, you know, they would ask about the bus and where's the bus come from. I thought, we're not here to tell them about buses, we had them to tell them about Krishna. So um, when we got to Vrindavan, and you know, there were some issues. <laughs> the personalities, I'm sure you're aware, that were challenging personalities that were on the bus. And uh, so the bus had to leave, and I had remained healthy. And I liked India. It was unexpected. I hadn't planned to come to India, but when I got there, I really liked it. So uh, the, the buses had to go, but what were the devotees going to do that were on the buses? So again, we approached Srila Prabhupada in Vrindavan, and that's when Prabhupada came up with the idea of Padhyatra. And I'm born in London. I'm not, um, you know, a, sort of a, a rural person. And the way that Prabhupada was describing Padhyatra, I was a little fearful of. Um, as he described it, you know, with enthusiasm, that Vaishnavas don't travel with grains, and you simply, you know, the, um, you know, the tradition was that uh, Brahmacharis and sannyasis would walk everywhere, just go from village to village. I wasn't sure that I was cut out for that particular experience. So, um, and some of the Indian boys, I noticed, because often we'd pick up you know, young Indian boys like Amadava who'd stayed with sadhus and, you know, had a, a real interest in Vedic culture. 
they would jump in. I mean, when Atmatama joined, he'd read the Bhagavatam and so forth, and you know, he he knew everything. You know, where, where we were sort of, I don't know, the fourth or fifth canto or something. So you know, it was a little bit difficult. But I noticed that some of these boys would chant shlokas, and Prabhu would really like it. They would chant some shloka glorifying Guru. Prabhu. I was like, okay, I, this is this is a really good. So when I looked through the Bhagavatam, I was like, okay, what, how can I approach Prabhupada, and see if I could maybe get out of this. Pandiatra service. So then I saw this Yad Yadda charity show. Whatever great people do, that's the people follow. I thought, okay, this is my ticket. So um, in Darshan, we were there, and I said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, this, this Pandiyatra, walking places, you know, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Yad Yadda charity show, says, whatever great people do, that's the people follow. So why are we going to the villages? You know, well, we won't find the great people there. So Prabhupada really shot back, he said, who are these great people that you want to preach to? No, I hadn't thought it through. <laughs> so, I, well, okay, who, who are these people? And Because I, I was thinking, you know, I'd quite like to go along and preach to life members or have sumptuous prasadam and be treated in a very sort of dignified manner, not wandering around the countryside, you know, with, you know just on foot. So I said, People in the media, people in films, uh, sports people, people on TV. How about those people? But I said, these people are not great. He said, in Kali Yuga, anybody that chants Hare Krishna, they are great. And those people you will find in the villages. So he said, but don't, he could see my concern. So Prabhupada said, but don't worry. Lokanath is village boy and he will look after you. So he said, we'll meet in Kumbh Mela and review. So, so this lesson to me was actually Prabhupada's wonderful, caring nature. He could see I was concerned. I wanted to bail, you know. <laughs> Maybe I should take the bus and leave, go back to Europe or something. But uh, he was saying, anybody can drive the bus. Take the bus. Anybody can go. I took the bus and I dumped it somewhere. In, I can't remember. It was in the Khyber Pass somewhere. We auctioned it off or something crazy thing. But so Prabhupada was saying, so you know, this is this is what you should try. Just try and see. And I saw. Right? So the way that Prabhupada presented it, I thought, okay, you know, it's only halfway between Vrindavan and Kumbh Mela. You know, we could we could make it there and I can I can bear that. So then I sort of tacitly agreed that, that I, I could go. And then in the evening time Prabhupada was lecturing in the courtyard of Vrindavan under the Tamal tree in the courtyard there. And he was lecturing in Hindi. So the local people were coming, probably was speaking in Hindi. So, the, you know, we were there. And the devotees would come, but after two or three days, listening to Prabhupada lecture in Hindi, some of the non-Hindi speaking devotees started to think, yeah, you know, I could be washing my dhoti, I could, you know, be taking some extra rest, whatever. You know, you're thinking, I've got better things to do. So, uh, so after three or four days, there was just, you know, two or three devotees, Western devotees coming. And Prabhupada looked around and he was, where are the devotees? And I thought, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say anything. Very, some very brave devotee, I can't remember. I can't remember if it was Satswarup Maharaj or... Anyway, some of the devotees that were there, they said, oh, Prabhupada, you're, you're lecturing in Hindi and, uh, you know, we can't understand. And Prabhupada said, you do not understand when I talk in English. So, all, <laughs> and then he said, the devotee should come every evening. It's very important that you hear from the spiritual master. And that was, again, a great lesson. It doesn't matter if you understand or don't understand. Because I had another experience, this was much later on in, in uh, we were going back to get books from, uh, from Mumbai Temple. And we went to see Srila Prabhupada and uh, he was inquiring, what books are you distributing? Prabhupada was always very interesting in what you're doing. He was like, well, you know, what, what are you doing? So we said, we're distributing which books? And I think it was uh, Marathi, Beyond Birth and Death, little books. And um, Bhagavad Darshan, back, Hindi back to God, or Marathi back to Godhead. And uh, so then we were in Prabhupada's room and Prabhupada said to Lokanath, he said, will you read me some? Mm -hmm. So, so Lokanath said, okay, well, go down to the Sankirtan. They asked me to go to the Sankirtan around and bring back a book. And then Lokanath started reading because he's from Maharashtra, he speaks Marathi. So he read a few pages, but obviously it was, his interest was... So he asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, do you speak Marathi? Do you understand Marathi? Prabhupada said, no, but it's always nice to hear about Krishna. 
So that was much later on, but again, a wonderful, you know, Prabhu was eager to hear about Krishna. It didn't matter whether you understood or not. It was Krishna's pastimes. So we started the Padhyatra, and again, being a Westerner, I was thinking A to B, Vrindavan to Mayapur, Grand Trunk Road, we'll just chug along there and we'll get to Kumamela, Alabad, and then we'll go on. And it was not like that. We'd arrive at a village, you know, Prabhupada instructed us very clearly, you go to the village, you go to the well, start kirtan, where its water is pure, you go round, you beg for grains, you beg for food grains, you prepare the food grains, you do uh, evening pravachan lecture and kirtan, distribute the prasadam, you move on. Simple formula. So we'd arrive at the village and they'd be so thrilled of course, this was still in Braj when we started off. They'd be so thrilled that we'd arrived. And we started off with quite a lot of devotees, you know, 20 or 30 devotees. So, you know, it was enthusiastic kirtans, and Prabhu was really behind the project, you know, he loved it. Oh, another story I've just remembered. So, but then we get to one village, and then the village will say, oh, you know, you've come to, you know, this village, but my village, we just installed Tulsi plant, Radha and Krishna, some thing that they really wanted us to go to. And then we get to that village and they, you know, the other village, and, and we weren't <laughs> going A to B at all. We were going X, Y and Z and not actually making any, we were just meandering around brudge basically. And, uh, and we had, you know, books to carry and our suitcase, not very big, a little box with a dhoti and a lota and a Bhagavad Gita, that was it. So, Lokana said, we need a cart we need a bullock cart to carry the deities and carry you know, the books and our equipment so we can do Sankatan and the bullocks can go and drop us off. Because we weren't, so then we could decide which direction we wanted to go. So Lokana Swami said, go back to Vrindavan and I'll give you two letters uh, to Srila Prabhupada, a copy you know, of the letter. And, uh, you give the letter to Prabhupada's secretary, and if you don't, if Prabhupada doesn't call you in uh, a couple of days, then go to the darshan and hand it directly into Prabhupada's hand. And Lokanath said, and come back with a bullock cart. He said, because Srila Prabhupada may offer to give you books, but you know, that will take us 10 years to raise enough money for a, for a cart. So he said, so don't come back with books, come back with a cart. So I journeyed back to Vrindavan and dutifully went to Prabhupada's room, gave the letter to the secretary and waited, went to the le lectures, which was, you know, it was great. Prabhupada's lecture in the morning and the evening. So it was really fantastic and, uh, but no call. So I thought, okay, well, uh, you know, I have to deliver it directly to Srila Prabhupada. So um, Darshan one evening in Prabhupada's room, and I stood up and I went, I said, this is a letter from Lokanath Swami. The secretary was there and he looked at me slightly crooked, like, hey, you know, this is not right. But I gave it directly to Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, okay, next morning, Prabhupada called me into his room. And uh, he said, I've received the letter from Lokanath Swami regarding the bullock cart. So in the Krishna book, there's some beautiful pictures of Krishna going from Gokul to Vrindavan. And these beautiful carts uh, in Vrindavan, you see them, the artisans have them, and they're very, they're wooden wheels, and they're beautifully decorated with uh, bits of copper, and, and they look really attractive. So one bullock and the cart, quite small, but we didn't need big. So I was, I was meditating this is, this is the type of cart, the type of cart that Krishna would have, we should have for the Sankatan party. So, so, so Prabhupada said, we will release books from the BBT. And then I was stuck between a bit of a rock and a hard place there, because I was going to have to disagree with Prabhupada and tell him that, you know, we couldn't take the books. So Prabhupada said, I'll release books from the BBT, you distribute the books, you raise the money, you buy the cart. And I said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, that, that won't work. So he said, why not? I said, well, in the villages, Srila Prabhupada, when we distribute a book, 
that book is passed around the village. So sometimes we distribute one book in the village. And, uh, you know, all of the other activities in the village are done by bartering. And probably said, that is correct. So I was slightly relieved that, you know. So he said, so I will give you the money from my personal account, but you have to pay it back without interest. So it was, and I think we got 5,000 rupees. I don't know what that is now. Not a lot. But at that particular time, 5,000 rupees was enough. But then, so I was thinking, result. Prabhupada's agreed to give us the money, and I'm going to go and get my beautiful cart. And Prabhupada said, and when you get the cart, don't get the cart with wooden wheels. <laughs> he said, get it with inflatable tires, because that is not subject to ta road taxation. Mm. And, I, and I was thinking, how did Prabhupada know that? You know, but he immediately took my brilliant plan and corrected it so that we wouldn't be in any financial difficulty. So with the, I, I got the money, I went off to buy the cart, painted it saffron, I was a brahmachari, went and got two bullocks and went and rejoined the Lokana Swami's party and of course we eventually got to Kumbha Mela and Prabhupada there were challenges, as I'm sure many devotees have told you, that uh, it was put in the wrong place, and Prabhupada was quite upset when he arrived, and we were so far away from everyone else, you know, the famous story about the elephant. It was Guru Das, I think, that was saying to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, we're going to put you on the elephant. Prabhupada said, no, he said, we will put Krishna, Radha and Krishna on the elephant. And I thought that was, that was a beautiful pastime. Now I realised, Prabhupada doesn't want glorification of himself, he wants... He wants us to focus on Krishna. And how he did it also. He said, people aren't coming to us, we're too far away, parked in the middle of nowhere. He said, so therefore we will have to go and take the Lord Chaitanya Sankirtan. This is the Sankirtan movement, we'll go. So of course, Chitananda was there, Chitananda Raj, and lots of devotees at Guru Kripa. So we went out in very brash mode, as you can imagine, very brash mode, and did Sankirtan in all of the big swamis and gurus, we just walk, go in, Harinam, pick up the microphone. Sometimes they even talk mid-lecture. Take the microphone, everyone chant, Hare Krishna. So we, we got Prabhupada's mercy like that in a very brash manner. When we were preparing to launch the Padiatra program, we decided that we would have to try and get Prabhupada's blessings in different ways. So we went to, um, we went around to try and raise money for um, some sort of offering that we were going to make to Prabhupada so that he would give us some mercy. And we collected, I don't know, 50 rupees or something. So then we were deciding, okay, what, what are we going to spend this on? You know? And uh, so one of the devotees said, well, okay, traditional offering, very specifically in South India, is coconut. And so we went and got some coconuts, um, you know, but proper, not kachu ones, not unripe ones, but real coconuts. And th these Indian boys were really expert. So they managed to undo that, and then they would cut them in very beautiful ways, so like in lotus and different things. So we, we got the plate from the pujaris, uh, the uh, Krishna Balan's pujari room, and then we put these uh, coconut and gur, which is pretty much all we could afford <laughs> at the time. And we decorated the plate with coconut. We went into Prabhupada's room and we said, Srila Prabhupada, this is you know, an offering so that you'll give us your blessings. And Prabhupada looked at the coconut and he said, very nice, he said, but I do not have the teeth. <laughs> he said, but you can distribute it as prasadam. So yeah, that was a very... And I, I realised at that time how simple and humble Srila Prabhupada was. You know, it was just a very beautiful thing. So we were so thrilled that he blessed the prasadam, but then we realised, yeah, maybe we should have come up with something maybe slightly softer than coconut. <laughs> well, obviously, eventually, the, the Bullock Cart Party, what, what was Padiatra and became the Bullock Cart Party, arrived in Mayapur, in Navadweep. And we took the Bullocks and the boat uh, across, to, across the Ganga to Mayapur, and we arrived in, in Mayapur um, quite late in the evening. And Bullocks don't like riding on boats. If you ever have a Bullock, don't put it on a small boat. So 
we arrived and very enthusiastically we ran up um, to Prabhupada's room uh, to tell him that we'd arrived. And when we got there, there were sort of like um, shields. You know, Prabhupada's quarters were there in the building in Mayapur where Prabhupada used to stay on the second floor, mm -hmm. something like that. And we ran up and there were these shields and as we were sort of started to try and go in, uh, Prabhupada's secretary came out and said, Prabhupada's um, not available, you, you'll have to come back tomorrow. And we were slightly disappointed and then Prabhupada came out and, and looked and who's arrived? And uh, he said, oh, it's the Padyatra. And I said, bring them into my darshan room. And we, we were like in ecstasy. So we all piled in there and the lights were turned on and Prabhupada was again inquiring, you know, how was it? And we related different experiences that we'd had on Padyatra where some people were very inviting and sometimes they were less inviting. And, uh, and Prabhupada asked the, his secretary who'd initially said that we shouldn't come in, he said, and I think this was probably the highest sort of benefit that Prabhupada, he said, bring the milk sweets from New Brindavan which, you know, we'd been on Padiatra for like a long time, living on Kishori, and suddenly, you know, we got, you know, these milk sweets from Rindava, which were absolute ecstasy. And that was probably was so pleased with the, the bullet cart party at that particular time. So while we were on the Sankirtan distributing books, occasionally we'd have to go back go to one of the temples to get topped up. Uh, Mumbai to the BBT or to Brindavan. So often, um, somehow or other, we'd make arrangements to go back and pick up books when we heard that Srila Prabhupada was there. So double bonus, we'd get books and we'd see Srila Prabhupada. And uh, a couple of experiences I had, one was in Mumbai. I went back and uh, in the evening time Prabhupada would sit on the roof and there were three uh, apartment buildings and, and Prabhupada lived in the middle one. and. Uh, other people lived there, people who lived there who, before we bought the property and so forth. So you'd go past all their houses and then uh, their uh, places where they lived and you get to Prabhupada's room. Mm. And up on the roof Prabhupada would sit there and give evening darshan. And one evening, one gentleman came and said, I'd like to sponsor you for, um, for Kumbh Mela, because Kumbh Mela comes very regularly. So Prabhupada, um, and I thought, wow, you know, because when we were there before, we'd made such a big mistake. I was thinking, oh, you know, maybe this is a better arrangement that someone else, someone who knows what they're doing, provides the tents and, the, you know, prasadam and everything. So I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, someone else do all the hard work. Can we just go there and do Harinam and distribute books? So Srila Prabhupada said, oh, uh, what would be the benefit for you? Prabhupada immediately realized that this offer came with maybe some strings attached. And Prabhupada knew that people got cachet from associating with us. They, you know, if all the devotees came to stay in their camp, whatever they were doing was, you know, made more important. So, uh, and the gentleman said, don't they, they said, so we just want to, you know, facilitate you at Kumamele. He made a very nice, uh, he said, and what is the philosophy of your group? And he was an elderly gentleman, I mean, probably as old as I am now, in his 60s. And he said, I've been a lifelong member of the Brahma Samaj. And I thought, okay. And uh, so then Prabhupada said, oh, uh, you know, so tell us, you know, what is your philosophy? So of course he started spouting this impersonal stuff, that, you know, we merge into Krishna. And, and then I saw Prabhupada do something that I realized that I couldn't do at all, probably ever, which was Prabhupada took apart this man's lifelong following, Prabhupada presented the personal philosophy in such a way that I felt sorry for this, for this gentleman that his lifelong following of the Brahma Samaj, Prabhupada just pointed out the fallacy of the, you know, the impersonal path. And Prabhupada said, no, Krishna is a person and you're also always a person. And this gentleman said, and I realized if I had tried to say to this elderly man, no, you know, your philosophy is wrong, we would have just got into an argument. But somehow Prabhupada just totally convinced this person that his lifelong following was completely misguided and that he should 
you know, take to the process of Krishna consciousness. And I was just absolutely in awe of that ability. And I realized it's because Prabhupada didn't have false ego. That his presentation of, of Krishna consciousness was so beautiful and pure that actually, you know, presenting it to anyone, they would, they would accept it. So that was one experience in, 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 in Mumbai. And then when I went to um, Brindavan, again, Srila Prabhupada was there, and Prabhupada would come out from his room and circumnavigate the temple and then go in for darshan and Guru Puja. So we got, there were no cleaners at that time, when you arrived at the temple, temple commander said, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that, you got engaged. And so I got there and they said, okay, you're going to sweep this or do that. And then we would gather in front of Prabhupada's room and he would come out and we would go and follow Prabhupada around and then we'd go into the temple. So this one time, um, I finished my job and I went round to the temple and the devotees hadn't gathered. They were all presumably doing their service. The problem was very punctual, and I can't remember, but he came out before the devotees arrived. So I was there waiting to, for the kirtan to begin, Jaya Prabhupada, and Prabhupada came out. And he looked around, it was me, you know, and he just did his, he didn't say anything at that time, he just went to do his parakram. So I thought, uh, okay, well, you know, we normally follow Prabhupada, so I was like following behind doing my little kirtan. So we got to the front of the temple, and Prabhupada turned and said, where are the devotees? And I was like, I don't know, Srila Prabhupada, they must be doing some service or something. Prabhupada said, where is Gunarnava, who was the temple president at the time? So I said, I'll go and get him. So I dashed round, and the devotees were gathering outside Prabhupada's room. Prabhupada had gone, but they were all there waiting for Prabhupada to come out. So Guru Nanda was, I said, Prabhupada's around the front. He said, what's he doing there? I said, well, you know, he came out early. And so they, we all dashed round, and then Guru Nanda came, said, Prabhupada said, so. And they looked across. At that time, there was like a, a water feature in front of the temple, some fountains. Mm -hmm. And then next to there was some, they were still fairly newly constructed, and there were some go-downs, some places where they stored stuff against the wall, against the outside wall. And Prabhupada said, what, what's in these? And they were just a corrugated tin, very simple. And, uh, and Gurunarva said, oh, I, I think there's cement in there. And they were padlocked. Prabhupada said, open the door. So Gurunarva didn't have the key, dashed away, came back, and, and then went, unlocked the key, unlocked the door, opened it up. And Prabhupada looked inside, very small, not very big at all. Prabhupada looked around, and he came out and he said, this is where I will have my samadhi. And then we went on. And I was thinking, wow, you know, in a hundred years' time, there's going to be a samadhi here for Prabhupada, you know. And, you know, Prabhupada went into Guru Puja, and you know, I didn't think of that again, that he'd said where it was. And then, of course, not that long, I don't know, maybe a year, uh, I looked down the side of the house where Srila Prabhupada was, his, his rooms in Vrindavan, and it was generally very low light, and the devotees were doing very low kirtan. And, uh, but this time the devotees were in the Tulsi garden in front, stacked up around. And I realized that you know, something very important is happening. So I ran down the side of the, the temple. And of course, you couldn't get in the front door, it was just jam-packed. But I had been in Vrindavan before, so I, went, I knew that the kitchen in the guest house then backed onto Prabhupada's garden. So I ran into the ran into the kitchen. I used to keep the coal there, clambered over the into Prabhupada's garden and ran through the, the garden doors. And the kirtan was there, Bharadraj was on the bed and the dhodis were chanting. And but the the thing that I wanted to tell you is that when I got into the room <coughs> The, o the overwhelming impression that I got was that the holy name, we, we've heard the kirtan, it was not the usual kirtan where one person was leading, it was just some, people, just some group chanting, some people following, it was just everyone was chanting. And I got this overwhelming impression that the holy name was carrying Srila Prabhupada back to Krishna. And the room was full of devotees and the only space in the room was Prabhupada's bed. And, the, and it was so overwhelming, this impression, that it came into my mind that perhaps 
if I looked up that I might see that the holy name penetrating the coverings of the universe and see Goloka Vrindavan. And it was just, uh, and I looked up and, I, and then I saw the ceiling. I couldn't see, I didn't have the eyes to see. And then I realized, oh, you know, no, you have to have Premanjana and Shurita for that. But then of course, you know, Prabhupada left. And, and then of course we, where Prabhupada said the Samadhi was gonna be, that's where the, the Samadhi was. So that was not the final part. I, at that point, was ordered to go off and get Narayan Maharaj. Prabhupada had asked that Narayan Maharaj oversee the, 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 the taking care of the spiritual master entering Samadhi. So I went to Mathura and picked up Narayan Maharaj and some Brahmacharis and, and bought, because I had the Sankirtan van. So there's advantages there, so then I went and brought them back to the temple and he came and they took care of the, the process of, of preparing the spiritual master. And Prabhupada came out. And at that time, Prabhupada came on his palanquin and took darshan of the deities and then was placed on the Vyasa sand. I thought Prabhupada is going to amaze us because the Kaviraja said Prabhupada stopped breathing. He was no longer breathing. And I thought, so Prabhupada was sitting there on the Vyasa sand. And I thought Prabhupada is going to amaze us all by demonstrating that he's transcendental to the body, that he could open his eyes and and carry on. It was a reluctance in me to accept that I might not have the opportunity again. But I just couldn't accept it. And then the next day, Pashima Prabhupada's sister came and, oh, was it the next day? I can't remember. Maybe it was the same evening. And she came and she offered a rose to Prabhupada. And at that time it hit me that she was saying goodbye to her brother, and that this was the last time that we were going to participate in Prabhupada's earthly pastimes.